uh, this talk is first paleomagnetic data from the Bleismar Darlor. Bleismar uh, Darlor. Exactly, just what I said. So when you're ready there, Adrian, take it away. Uh, thank, thank you, Connell. Hopefully you can all see my, my screen now. So this is work that was done with uh, Morton Rhesus, who's now at the Ferrari's Geological Survey, and Connell, who's just been speaking. Um, there was a number of uh, summer students at Imperial, so Stefan Mathea and Hassan, who's now doing his PhD at uh, Cambridge, who helped all the measurements, plus uh, an M, I think it's MS or MSI student at, in Oxford called Carrie, who also helped with the measurements. Um, so why did we go to Northern Iceland and collect some samples and what, what was the point? So let's just go back and have a look at paleomagnetism 101. Um, one of the things you first learn when you do paleomagnetism is the idea that the magnetic inclination we measure uh, tells you about the paleo latitude. So tan I equals two tan land and we all know that. And this is based on the assumption that if we average the geomagnetic field over a long enough period of time, um, we end up with something called the geocentric axis or dipole. So we essentially have a dipole field, which is aligned with the rotation axis. And hopefully everyone who's in the audience should be familiar with this. Now, the question is how long do you have to average the field? So here's uh, some, some different uh, periods of being, uh, of, of averaging. So in, the, in figure A we have up here, we have historical data and you can see we don't quite have the GAD, which is what we'd expect if we had a proper GAD field. Um, we don't ha quite have the GAD here. If you go from zero to 7,000 years, again, it doesn't quite match, match this. And if we go over a longer period of time, so in work by Catherine Johnson and Catherine Constable, they looked at a period of 5 million years. And again, you can see it doesn't quite match up with the, with the GAD field. And if we have a look at this in a little bit more detail, um, so this is now looking at the deviation from the GAD field as a function of latitudes. This is for directional data. So this is deviation. So that a perfect GAD field would be plotting, the data should be plotting along this line in the middle. And you can see that it seems to deviate as a function of latitude. Um, and we have to fit components, permanent components of, um, of uh, quadrupole and octopole components down here, six or 3% to get the directional data to align, uh, to, to accommodate this data. Um, I presented some of this data at a meeting in Cape Town, 2017. It was one of these sessions that was combined modelers and, um, and uh, data people. And I presented the data and the data didn't agree with their theory. And I was told that the data was wrong, which I think was, uh, I didn't really agree with it at the time because you know the model should follow the data, not the other way around. So that's the directional data. But if we look at the paleo intensity data, the, the, the deviation is even bigger. So here we have in this figure here, we have the we again we have the bin data, it's been folded around. So southern and northern hemisphere data is combined together. And we have the green points here are the are, are the data. And to try and get anything to sort of, so here we have gray line, we have the dipole model. So this is what we would expect. We'd expect it to, the intensity to increase from the equator up to, um, up to the uh, northern latitudes. And if you look at the data, which is, which is for the last 5 million years, uh, collected from the Pint uh, database, which Andy Biggin and the guys in Liverpool um, very kindly administered for the, for the entire community. Um, you can see that the, we don't get that trend. We kind of get something that comes kind of sort of increases and then a very high latitude that seems to go down. Um, now, one of the one of the complaints up against the paleo intensity data is there isn't that much of it, especially at high latitudes. There's a lot of data here. So this gray, this green band here shows you the sort of error on these estimates. And you can see that it's a lot of very narrow band here. And the reason for this is because this is where Hawaii is and people like to go to Hawaii and sample the rocks there. Well, if to go to other latitudes, you can see there's quite large errors. And one of the complaints that the, the modelers have said, well, you're, the reasons your data doesn't fit the model is because you haven't got enough data points. And so this is particularly interesting at high latitudes. Um, and paleo intensity data is particularly sensitive at high latitudes. So here's a figure from Catherine Constable where she, where in, the, in this figure, if we have these different sampling points, we have a, a low, we have an equator, a mid-latitude, and a high-latitude, depending on what parameter we're looking at, declination, inclination, 
or the intensity, um, depending on that, when we project the, the sampling area of the, at the core mental boundary of the field that we're actually sampling, project down onto the core mental boundary from what we're measuring on the surface, you can see that the intensity data when we measure at high latitude is really sampling at very high latitude data. Whereas if you look at the inclination, um, it's affected by this region here. So we're, we're actually, if we measure the inflation at, in Iceland say, then we're actually being affected by this large area here of, of the field and where it's generated. And the declination is, is even, even worse. So you really look, the intensity data is the most sensitive to, to um, high latitudes variations of the field. So we wanted to uh, locality with uh, high latitudes, uh, lots of continuous lava sequence and something that's relatively new, modern. So if we, we want something where we can essentially ignore plate tectonics. So Iceland is the perfect locality and it's a very simple geology. You have a sort of spreading ridge down the middle. The further you get away from that, the older the rocks get. So this is nice, simple geology. Um, so we decided to go there and sample some rocks. Now, you can't mention fieldwork in Iceland without mentioning Leo Christensen, who unfortunately died early last year from, from cancer. Um, he just retired, so that's really quite tragic. Well, not just retired, but he'd retired a few years before, but he, he was still quite young, so that was quite tragic. Um, now, Leo has done amazing fieldwork in Iceland. He spent the last 40 years going everywhere, and we've been to some of the localities that he's been to, and they're, they really are quite hard to get to. So he's really a great field geologist, but Leo never really liked paleo intensity work. He didn't really believe in paleo intensity. So thought it didn't work very well. So all the work samples that he's collected and done and literally thousands of sites that he's sampled, he's always focused on directional data. Whereas we think the intensity data is actually more helpful in this case. So whilst there's a wealth of data for Iceland, there isn't actually that much paleo intensity data. So several years ago with colleagues, Morten Connell and also Ari Dossing from DTU in Denmark, we started sampling uh, various locations in Iceland. So we started off here in East Iceland and we published a couple of papers down here on, on the work there. We did a PhD project in, in central Iceland here with a student Ake and we still have yet to publish that data, unfortunately, we, we took a long time to get the Argon date. So that's why there's been a bit of a delay in getting, getting that published. Um, but what we wanted to do as part of this study was to try and tie up the, the eight to get a sort of continuous sequence. So we wanted to tie up the sequence with the, the sequence over here. So we wanted to collect some samples that were slightly younger than the ones we've been sampling as part of AIC's PhD thesis. So here we have is Blake's Lakes Mira de Lua, and I'm sure Connell's going to correct me for that. And this is the valley that uh, Ake did his PhD in, it's even harder to pronounce, Ia Fjord de de Lua, is where we did this work. And Connell's done field work in there. And also Brendan, as part of uh, one of his, his uh, MSI project when he was in Oxford, also helped to sample some of these localities here. So these are the ones we studied before. And we wanted to sort of tie something in that was quite close, but slightly younger. So we're interested in this valley here. Now, this valley is very, very easy to get to. There's a dirt track road that dries up. You just take a four by four, you drive along. It's quite simple to get to. Blake's Mira de Lua, which is this one here, is pretty much uninhabited. There's no roads, there's no nothing. So even though it's not very far to get to from here to here, it's actually quite hard work. So we ended up having to drive quite a long way across this kind of surface here, which took us an awful long time. So it's not that it's a long way, it's just that it's kind of hard to get to. And remember, driving off roads can be dangerous. So you can see down there that someone else a little bit less care, careful than we were when getting there. So I just want to stress that getting to this valley is actually quite a lot of work. Um, we spent uh, just over a week there sampling, uh, spent our time crossing uh, rivers which are just above freezing and getting, this is Connell here, and this is me on, on the right, get eaten alive by flies. So it's a wonderful uh, sampling place. But um, there's some great sections. So there, you know, there was, we found three great sections. So, I mean, Morton had actually been out the, the year before to the same valley and mapped it all. So we, we knew what we were going for when we were actually sampling. And this is one of our sections. So we typically collect in the lava as we start at the bottom and just work our way up. Connell likes to drill and the rest of us kind of follow him up the hill. Um, 
So we did standard uh, paleomagnetic analysis. The, the data is very, very nice. All the data from Iceland tends to be very nice. You have a little viscous component and then bang, straight to the origin, whether it doesn't matter whether it's thermal or AF, it tends to be very well behaved. Unfortunately for this particular week we were there, we got very little uh, sun. So we had very few sun orientations. And for those who are used to working, who know about working with large sequences of uh, basalts, you tend to get quite large magnetic anomalies um, associated around that. And work we've done in, elsewhere in Iceland showed that you can routinely get values, deviations of 20 to 30 degrees. So unfortunately, this particular, the directional data that we got wasn't really good enough to do isn't really good enough to do directional analysis of the GAD field, but it is good enough to do magnetostratigraphy. So we need to build an age model. So we've managed to use, combining the stratigraphy in the field with the magnetostratigraphy, we've started to build an age model. Um, again, we are waiting, so the age model isn't complete, but we, we know that the ages are between something like 3.2 to 2.5 million years. I'm not gonna finalize this because we're currently uh, getting some samples dated in East Kilbride, um, Argon sample, uh, Argon dating. Um, they've been with them two years now. They said it happened by December 2020, and we haven't gotten, but I can happily wait another month or two for, for that. Um, so that the age model isn't quite complete, but hopefully that will be soon. But the main focus of our, our work was really um, the paleo intensity work. So unlike Liverpool, which like doing a multi uh, protocol technique, and I, I actually do like that approach, doing lots of protocol. The problem is when you've got lots of samples, do you, do you do, how do you do it? So we've, we've just attended to try and process lots of samples just to stick to techniques that are tried and test, tested and don't give any problems with the, with the reviewers. So we've done the Izzy technique, which is a type of Tellier method. And we made 186 attempts at getting a paleo intensity, but we only end up with 52 estimates, which was a little bit lower than what we'd hoped for because in previous work in Iceland, we had a success rate of up to about 60% for the, for the rocks. But for these particular ones, we had a success rate of less than uh, 30%. Anyway, I'm just showing you a typical array plot, some curve, some not. Um, okay, so then to jump to the results, we, we had all these samples. We ended up, all these individual sites, we ended up with nine estimates for the uh, paleo intensity from, from only nine sites. Some of them we had to chuck away at the, the site level as well as at the individual level. So if we look at the pint database here, we can see this is the, for the, for the same bin that we're looking at, we can see the mean PI is here. And this is the data that we've collected. So on the whole, it's slightly lower than what was there before, but not that much lower. Okay, oops. So how does this relate to the, the data, the figure I showed you earlier? So here's the figure I showed you earlier with the data. And we're interested in this particular, what we're doing is just sampling this point here. So before there was, I think a total of about only 48 paleo intensity estimates, that's from 48 sites, make up this particular point in the pint, pint database after you've put in some criteria to, to select points. So, you know, minimum number of uh, estimates to make a site reading, that sort of stuff. So the argument from the modelers was that our, this data point should be further up, should be closer to this dipole curve. And the reason it wasn't higher is we didn't have enough data. So the idea would be that if we added more data, added more data, we should be going moving this point up. Now, of course, I've just shown you on the previous figure that our data actually lies beneath that. So it's down here, so it's lower than the average. So of course, when you add in, uh, sorry, when you add in an extra point, rather than moving this, so, when it, so this blue point is now the combined mean of what was in the pint database plus uh, our new Alex Mira Dolor uh, point, you can see that we've actually moved this green point has moved downwards to where the blue point is. So if anything, we've moved away from the GAD model. So it would appear that this small contribution to the total data set is suggesting that the, the data is not actually, uh, it doesn't really fit this dipole model. 
So just, I said it was gonna be a short talk. So just to wrap up the conclusion, I mean, there's obviously still work, more work to be done here. I haven't shown you any, any rock magnetic data, which I have measured, but not really analyzed yet. Um, and we obviously need the argon dates as well. Um, so the new data does not support the GAD hypothesis at high latitudes. And you can tell, I just added this, uh, the second point following on from Andy Biggins talk yesterday. So the models I've shown you, these calculations for the, for the contributions from the octopul and, and uh, quadrupole field, th these, are, these are calculated using the giant Gaussian process models. And uh, a lot of people have used those, uh, Lisa Tax and, and Kathy Constable. And I've, in the paper that I published, I, I used one of, the, one of these models to, to do that. Um, and perhaps we should be not using these types of models and moving away to some of the ideas that Andy said about trying to, um, yeah, trying to use maybe a dynamo model to try and predict behavior, especially at high latitudes. Okay, thank you for listening. Bang on 15 minutes. Thank you for that, Adrian. It's a very interesting talk. So we have time for a quick question or two. Uh, I'll I'll ask a quick question if I may. Um, just about the um, uh, your selection for the for the for the GAD model um, from Pine. What um, were you specifying certain age range? Were you um, strict on the data selection technique, so on? I wonder what you're comparing against. Um, this is from memory because it's from the 2017 paper, but it's. <laughs> It's we, we, Telier data only, so that's obviously chucks out quite a lot of stuff. Zero to five, well actually it wasn't, I think we, we removed the first 30,000 years, so 30,000 years up to five million years, because obviously you buy there's so much data from the first 30,000 years. Um, and then I think we had to have at least three estimates from a site to give it, and then obviously the deviation less than 25%. I'm not sure what the value is of having having three points and a deviation of less standard deviation less than twenty five percent. That's getting a bit dodgy on the stats, but that's the thing. That was the criteria. I'd have to check what the other ones were. Yeah. I think those are the main ones. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm looking at the, the database. It should give you a fair fair sampling from Russia and um, and Greenland and stuff. Yeah. I mean, just really very surprising results that you're showing there, Adrian. Like very very low paleo intensities for such high. Um, High latitudes, so. Yeah, I know. And um, well, I mean, uh, the thing is, the new data we've got is low as well, but it, it, it doesn't really disagree that much with the previous data, which was yeah. also low. So, you know, I don't think there's anything shocking. It's more, it's, it's just a question of w what's really happening to the field at high, uh, high latitudes. And, you know, if you look at the, if we were to assume a GAD field at high latitudes, if you were to do a paleo, Geographic reconstruction. I mean, Arnie estimated that you get a up to 500 kilometer, you know, mismatch in where you're predicting it should be. Whereas if you've got a field that's not quite a, you know, with a 5% octopole quadrupole component. So, you know, mm. it could be a, an issue for people who are using GAD. We all, a lot of people use GAD, right? As part of the, the as part of their paleo geographic reconstructions. And maybe we need to be a little bit more careful with that in terms mm. of you know, what's the error on, you know, maybe it gives you a chance to move things around a little bit more in your reconstructions. I, I mean, you know, <clears throat> potentially it could be because you're between the flux patches, right? So your high latitude flux patches, which are dominating GAD, you know, or dominating the, the, the dipole. I suspect it is the flux moment. patches. And I suspect, you know, using a dynamo model, as you were talking yesterday, might be a better way to try and make predictions of what's expected at high latitudes. Because I'm not sure these, these Gaussian models are, I mean, they're quite simple, right? So, you know, they're not really capturing all the features. Yeah, yeah. but it would need to be, Dynamo models would need to have some uh, heterogeneity on the core mantle boundary to, uh, to, to, to get the flux patches to be stable. But, but yeah, I was going to say the flux patches would have to be stable and long lived. Mm. But that, that's, yeah. that's quite, quite possible, yeah. at least on these sorts of timescales, tens of millions yeah. of years. Yeah. Yeah. We can just make time for just one more quick question and we'll move on to the flash posters. Uh, I have less of a quick question and more of just a, a blatant self-promotion, but the new GGP model that, that uh, we put out does have a, a sort of some zonal non-zero components that do try to match at least um, 
the the Cromwell uh, inclination anomaly record. So, like I said, blatant self promotion, but there are some GGP options out there that do kind of capture some of this. That, that was about it.